I pray that you're well on today. This is Pastor Hagwood of First Mountain Time Missionary Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. Again, God's blessings to you. I pray. PM Bible study hour. I had to get home quickly in order to get uh, things rolling and uh, so forth on today. Uh, you all bear with me, please, because uh, sometimes technology doesn't want to work appropriately and uh, things of that nature. But um, with that, again, we've got everything kind of uh, set up and so forth for tonight um, uh, to be able to um, get, our, get all of our pieces and our parts together. Um, just wanted to make sure everything was posting correctly uh, on our site uh, on tonight. I was kind of looking at some things here on Facebook, so y'all forgive me in regards to that. Um, again, I uh, met y'all last week. Uh, I was in uh, residency last week um, for uh, my, my doctor of ministry program. Um, and thank God I didn't have to actually go physically to the site because of COVID. I didn't have to go all the way up north uh, to Philadelphia. Uh, which I would have enjoyed the trip because I enjoyed the last time uh, I went through the process of doing it, but um, I didn't have to actually go, so I was actually able to do everything here at home uh, via Zoom, uh, via virtual uh, learning, if you will, and we actually had our sessions and our meetings and so forth. And now I've got all the work I need to do. Continue to pray for me in regards to this process. Uh, this technically is my last semester of in-class, uh, in-class classes. Um, uh, I'm, I'm on that road now toward a um, uh, dissertation project and prayerfully um, this time next year I can kind of get things together, put everything together, research uh, and so forth and go ahead and uh, get the dissertation done uh, hopefully next year uh, to have it done about this time next year and, um, and prayerfully um, um, finish this process uh, and, uh, in uh, the spring of 2023. Uh, God willing. So with that, just continue to pray for me in regard. Uh, again, I missed you last week, but uh, glad to be with you now uh, as God will continue to get us through uh, the process of uh, the study on tonight. We are still in the book of Acts, um, Acts chapter number 11. Uh, we ended chapter 10 two weeks ago. Um, and what you're going to do, what you're going to see is that this is kind of a recap in chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 18. Of, of chapter 10. And um, I want to kind of talk about that because you're going to hear some of the very same things um, that you heard uh, in the previous uh, few weeks in regard to chapter 10. But it's literally a recap testimony by Peter of the accounts that happened. But also there's a underlining uh, theme or themes uh, regarding it that I want to kind of talk about uh, in regards to the establishment of the church, the salvation of Jesus Christ, um, who can receive it, and um, the lesson that is taught within the lesson in and of itself uh, on tonight. So I pray that you are well. Uh, again, uh, just thank God for you on today and what he is going to do in our midst, uh, even on tonight. So with that being said, um, um, I got my comments and all this stuff going now, and now I got everything kind of set, and I hope my technology will continue to work for me as we go through the process of the study tonight. Again, we're in chapter number 11 of the book of Acts, and we're going to go through verses 1 through 18 on tonight. But before we get started, I want to have a word of prayer before we get there. Uh, First Mount Zion family, please keep in prayer um, our church. Uh, just keep in prayer all the things that are going on for those at First Mount Zion and for all of you as well, anyone else who's listening. Uh, we will resume worship. We will resume in-person worship. In-person worship on first Sunday in March. Uh, first Sunday in March, just keep that in mind. Um, be ready to come back into the worship space in order to um, be part of the community and fellowship so that we can give God praise together. So with that said, I want to have a word of prayer. As we get started on tonight uh, with our lesson again, Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. Uh, please pray with me. Father God, we 
thank you and honor you, God, for today. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us to this place of study. We ask right now in the name of Jesus that you would lead us and guide us throughout the study, O Lord, in the 11th chapter of Acts, and allow us, God, to see your glory, to connect those places, O Lord, uh, be connected in those places of your word that will allow us, O Lord, uh, expansive reach, will allow us, Lord, to connect with you further, as well as be, be able to connect with humanity. Lord, I pray for anyone who is dealing with any uh, level of ailment or even bereavement or um, something that they're dealing with right now, Lord. I put that before you even now. I don't know what exactly what it may be, but you do. And Lord, I put that before you even now as we pray, as we enter the study. Bless us, keep us, and allow us, Lord, to see your glory as, Lord, we continue to seek and find, ask, uh, Lord, and it will be given to us. If we, if we continue to do that which you have asked us to do, then, Lord, you would bless us immensely. Bless us, Lord, and continue to give us what we need on this journey of life. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So with that said, Acts chapter 11 is where we're going to go on tonight. And I'm going to jump right into the text um, because if you have been joining us, and remember, you can always see any of the um, the Bible study lessons, even our sermons, Sunday school lessons, things of that nature, you can always go back either on Facebook, on our page, at First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, on our Facebook page, or please subscribe to our YouTube page, uh, which is, <clears throat> just go to uh, youtube.com, look up, <clears throat> excuse me, First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, and you'll be able to find us there, okay, and you can actually find us there and pull up any of the sermons, study, anything that we've recorded on Facebook Live, it is out there for your viewing pleasure. Uh, so never think that, like, I'll, I'll never think, man, I missed that lesson. Go to YouTube and you'll find it. It'll be, it'll be there. Uh, and you'll be able to look at the sermons again, view the studies, and be able to take notes at your leisure. Okay? Um, it's good to have that. So with that, we're going to go into Acts chapter 11 on tonight. Again, verses 1 through 18. I'm going to go ahead and read through entirety of the text and then we're going to kind of get through some get to some explanations of of this text on uh of tonight so i'm reading from the niv version and this is what it says acts 11 chap uh acts chapter 11 verse number one it says the apostles and the believers throughout judea heard that the gentiles also had received the word of god so when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance, I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet beating, uh, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my, my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, there, uh, right then three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea, stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you 
and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objection and praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. May the Lord add a blessing to a reading of his holy word, and may it truly sanctify us to the deepest roots of our very heart and being. Now, let's get into the text. Before we get there, let's recount what happened in chapter 10. Uh, kind of get a real clip notes version of what actually happened in chapter 10. Remember Cornelius, a Roman centurion who was doing good works, was feeding the poor, and so forth, and he sees a vision from God, okay? And he, hear, he hears from God saying, send some folk down to John, right outside of Tel Aviv, right on the Mediterranean coast. Send them to Simon the Tanner's house, okay? And there's a man named Simon who they call Peter. I need for you to get, get him and bring him to your house, okay? Then we know that Peter... And more importantly, let me let me go back to 10 so I don't misquote the, the, the narrative in the story. So Peter gets a vision, and basically it comes down to the point where it says, um, where, where the Lord puts four, uh, puts beasts and animals in front of Peter and tells him to get up, kill what's there, and eat it. Okay? And this definitely takes Peter aback because Jewish culture would not allow them to eat anything that was unkosher, okay? And anything like reptiles or birds and so forth was unkosher. Uh, and so because of that, Peter says, I'm not going to put anything to defile my mouth, anything unclean in my mouth. I'm not going to do it. And so the Lord says to him, these words and says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And so with that, this happened again three times, okay? Happened three times in, in the same occurrence where where, where the these uh, beasts were brought down. And, and, and the Lord told Peter, get up, kill, and eat. And then all of a sudden, it was taken back up into heaven, okay? So... This for Peter meant more than just food. It was a sign to him of, of, of some things that were going to happen, okay? Some things that were going to happen, some things that were going to uh, transpire. So he sees his vision, and the voice spoke to him. And uh, while Peter was wondering about uh, the meaning of the vision, this is when the men showed up, okay, uh, from Cornelius' house to come and get Peter, to bring Peter to Cornelius' house, okay? And so, the period, it says, the Spirit of the Lord said to Peter, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. So he heard from the Lord to go with these men. But so when he goes, when Peter goes, when he gets to Cornelius' house, Cornelius invites him in. Well, Cornelius has called his family members and friends, and they're all at the house, okay? And so Cornelius said, I basically brought all these folks over here because we're going to shut up. We're not going to say anything else. You're here. And the Lord has told me to bring you here and to listen to what you have to say. And at that moment, Peter begins to basically preach. He begins to give them 
uh, the path towards salvation. And it says in that instance that the Holy Spirit came on those that were in the room. Now, these individuals that were there were not Jews. They were Gentiles, okay? And so in, in that instance, that's when Peter said, well, they just received the Holy Spirit just like we did. So they need to be baptized. And then that is the occurrence that ended up happening is that um, those individuals in Cornelius' house, including Cornelius, were baptized. And when they were baptized, um, they were baptized uh, with water and received the Holy Spirit. Um, and he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them uh, a few more days. So that is the, that's the narrative. That's the Cook Notes version story. Now, when we get to chapter 11, what we have here is Peter now recounting this very same story that I just told you all from chapter 10. He's now recounting this entire story again, but now his audience are individuals of, 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 of the Hebrew nation, uh, Jewish individuals, Jews. That's his audience now. And, and now he begins to give the same story once again, but the audience is now different. And now I'm going to start at verse 1 of chapter 11. I want to kind of break this down because I want you to see something different in regards to the same occurrence that happened. Remember, all Peter is doing is giving a testimony of what had occurred. But again, remember, any testimony that is given about the magnificence of God and what he has, has, done, <clears throat> has done is always some level of a lesson or lessons that we need to learn from in order, in order to not only project the power of God, but to hear what the lesson is for some level of, of understanding, reproof, correction, whatever it may be, it allows us further entrance or further journey into, into our own spiritual maturation and connection with God. It is all part of the sanctification process that God is doing in us who are saved. Okay? So with that, I want to read here verse 1 of chapter 11. And it says, The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers, remember the Jews, criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Now, I want you to see here the level of divorce and separation that these Jews immediately, immediately began to criticize and harp on Peter about. Okay? As he's given the testimony, immediately they went in to find criticism and they said, you went into this man's house, he's uncircumcised, he's unclean, and because of that, you went in, not only did you go in with him, but you ate with him. You ate with him, Peter, and you know we don't do that. We don't associate ourselves with those type of folks, okay? And I need to help someone here because there is, even in the church, unfortunately, we have these uh, places of um, separation and, 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 and uh, annihilation, if you will, alienation, that's really the word I want to use, alienation, where we say that's them and that's us, okay? And, and God's church is, was never designed, never called to be a place of disunion. So with this, God is of no respect of person. And the Bible teaches us that. That he is of no respect of person. And because he knows he's of no respect of person, then no one individual or group can try to supersede or make themselves look bigger or higher or greater than another group. 
because all of us are all created in God's image. And now this is where the problem comes in for Peter, okay? It's not the problem really for Peter, it's the problem that the Jews have with Peter. The issue is, is that he's associated himself with people that, he's, that they feel he shouldn't associate himself with. And this again is a large part of the problem of the church. Is that a lot of times the church feels that since we're called out, that God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, that now we have to ostracize other groups. And that's not what God has told us to do. What God has told us, he said, be, he said, be in the world, but not of the world. That's all he told us. And all that means is, is the activities that are against the, the, the characteristics and salvation and righteousness of God. So now, the dilemma is we need to separate ourselves away from them as if they are the problem, as if um, that's them and that is us. No, you don't associate with those folk, okay? And that's where much of the issue that we have in churches comes from, okay? Um, I think someone said this, uh, I don't know if it was Martin King or your Malcolm X that said it, that the greatest separation that you see on any day of the week is on Sunday morning. When folk go to their respective houses of worship uh, and so forth, and we're either divided by denomination, we're divided by race, we're divided by ideology, we're divided by, sometimes even by theology. And this is where Peter has to begin the process of trying to tell the Jews that no, 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 this, no, we're all in this together. But it's amazing how we will oftentimes attempt to separate ourselves away from other individuals and think as though we have, we're the only ones that have, that have some level of privilege to what, to what God has offered for everyone. And this is the issue that comes in. He says, they say, you 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 sat, you went into their house and you knew they were unclean. You sat on their carpet or you sat on their, their furniture and you knew they were unclean. You ate their food and you knew they were unclean. But see, this is the issue that now Peter is going to have to address to tell them why the question then becomes, well, why are they unclean? What makes us or makes you so different that now you have a, you feel you have an ownership, again, a right towards God that no one else can have, that no one else, a relationship with God that you feel no one else can exhibit or have or possess. So I want you to see this because as we're talking about the foundations of the church, the church has to be welcoming to all people. The church has to be welcoming to anyone whosoever will who steps in those doors. And that's why it's important for us to realize that we cannot have dichotomy in the church. That's a big word that just basically means we cannot have separations by the classes or cliques or by race or what have you. We can't have that. Now, we may worship in our different contexts. We may be in a, in a black church, African-American church, or a Caucasian or Asian church, and so forth. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, there is no separation. In heaven, you don't, you're don't. you not going to have the black folks over here, the black Christians over here, and the white Christians over there, and the, the Baptists over there, and the Methodists over here, and the Presbyterians somewhere uh, off to the side. You're not going to have that. And I think that when we begin the process of understanding that we're more alike than we are different, we will begin to take these barriers down, man-made barriers down, that continue to push each, each of us away from each other when God is trying to bring us into the centrality of fellowship. This is something I hope that you begin to, to understand um, more and more because 
the sake of the kingdom of God um, counts on it. It really does. And and Peter is now having to address this based off his testimony, or he will address it. But he just giving his testimony right now. And remember, these folks are now criticized. Of all the good that just happened, it's amazing how we can take all of this good and find something very immaterial and blow it up. Blow it up and say, Peter, you were wrong. Why were you associating with those people? Without seeing the great expansiveness of the glory of God and his salvation in what his testimony is offering. Hmm. Something to think about. Just meditate on that. Let's go a little further in the text. Verse 4. And it says, starting from the beginning, Peter told them this whole story. Now, here's the narrative. He the, he's going to give the narrative again. I was in the city of Joppa praying. And in a trance, I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to where I was. I looked into it, saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. <laughs> now, I'm going to stop right here for a second. Again, he said he replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. And we know that that is untrue from the perspective, not of food, but of him betraying Christ. Um, allowing Satan uh, to, to, to deal with him to the point where he denies Christ three times before, of course, Christ was crucified. And then it says the voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had been an angel, how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, send to Joppa for Simon, who was called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved, okay? As I began to speak, this is Peter still speaking, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Now, what Peter now is doing is making the connection to Pentecost, or Pentecost to what he experienced or what Cornelius, um, what they had experienced, what Peter basically had experienced right there in Cornelius' house, okay? that the Holy Spirit came on these Gentiles, a Roman centurion and all his family and friends, that the Holy Spirit came upon them, just like the Holy Spirit had come on all of those at Pentecost. Now, why is Peter saying this? I believe one of the main reasons Peter is saying this is that he's saying that God is of no respect of person, that if he wishes to give the gift of the Holy Spirit after someone has accepted the message of Jesus Christ, that he'll do it, he will do it, and it doesn't matter if they're a Jew or a Gentile, doesn't matter if they're black, white, Hispanic, Asian, and all, Indian, and all other races, it doesn't matter that at, the, at that point, God will give the gift of the Holy Spirit to anyone 
accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And he makes it clear because what he wants to do is to crush this aspect of uh, distinction of one group over another. He wants to eliminate that because it causes division, is divisive, it, do, it doesn't it, it doesn't promote unity at all, and he wants to crush it. He wants to crush that mentality because we cannot go into a place of unity in Christ when we as people, as races, and say we love Christ, to say that we are born again, to say we've been saved by the blood of the Lamb, and we still continue to separate ourselves, separate ourselves, and say that's them and this is us. And when we are really the entire body of Christ. And this is why this is so important in this lesson to get. The testimony reiterates the fact of what God is doing. It also displays how God could speak not only to Peter, but also speak to someone who wasn't Jewish, who was Cornelius. How God spoke to him, how God spoke to Peter, and how both messages that they received were in sync with each other. They were tied together. Meaning that God is of no respect the person that God can speak to a Jew, someone who's Jewish, but he can also speak to someone who is a Gentile. God can speak to someone who is black, but also he can speak to someone who is white, Hispanic, Asian, whatever other race. God can speak to someone in Africa while he's talking to someone in North Carolina or Alexandria, Virginia, or D.C., or Seattle, Washington. God can speak. He is of no respect to person, and whoever he wishes to bestow the power of his spirit on, he will do it. He will do it. So let's don't let's not think for one second that there is one group of people or one race or one denomination that has more of God than someone else. More of an understanding of the Christian faith than someone else. More of a relationship with God than someone else. Because this thing is about unity. And this is why the connection of this and the testimony is so powerful. God didn't give inconsistent messages to Cornelius and Peter. Both of the messages that were received were consistent. They were consistent. And I need for someone to understand this because it's going to help you in the long run with regards to how you look at other people when they begin the process of professing their faith. Okay? You can't override one race over another and say, I have more of God because I have 12 degrees on my wall versus someone who doesn't even have a high school diploma. No, 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 no. We're talking and speaking of the things of the divine. And then when you begin to do that, you're placing barriers and limits on the infinity of God. Wow. Woo, this is getting rich. And I only got about 30 more minutes left. But this is the reality, y'all. And I, and I need for us to understand this because it begins to continue to make the connection of our salvation and that we are not exclusive. That one particular group is exclusive. No, this is an inclusive group faith. This is an inclusive faith. And we've got to keep excuse me y'all, keep that in mind as we continue to go along life's journey. Okay? Hmm. Now I'm going to go to verse 16 through 18 with some other verses I need to talk about as I talk about this. Verse 16, this is what Peter says. Peter says this. Peter says, then I remembered what the Lord had said. Well, here we go. 
says John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, this now comes into the recollection of Peter's mind, and he begins to recount the ministry of Christ as well as what he experienced at Pentecost. Now, why is this important? Because God will bring things back to our remembrance to remember that we either saw or heard certain things that God wants us to remember that it's consistent with what's being experienced even now. Okay, watch this. Um, Y'all forgive me, I'm, I'm thinking about the scripture. In verse 16, he, he quotes the scripture, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's what Peter remembers. Now watch this. Show you, just show you a little bit of how God works and how his consistency is just inevitable. It's, it's just there. And, and it's something that you can just say hallelujah to because it just connects. Now watch this. I'm going to turn to the Gospel of Mark, okay? The Gospel of Mark, chapter number one. Now listen to this. And you can, you can turn with me as well. Again, Mark chapter one, second gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. Of course, the three synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Luke chapter, excuse me, Mark chapter one. Mark chapter one. I'm going to tell you why this is important here in a second. Because there's a historical connection here. Mark chapter 1, verse 8. Okay? Now, let me start here with really at verse, um, let me just start at verse 1. I'm going to read it down to verse 8. So you can get to understand what's, what's being read here. Watch this. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And again, this is out, that's out of Isaiah, um, out of Isaiah chapter number uh, 40. That's where it is, okay? That these words were spoken by Isaiah talking about John the Baptist. Now watch this, verse 4 of Mark chapter of Mark chapter 1. It says, and so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. Verse 7. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. Verse 8. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is John the Baptist speaking, okay, in the Gospel of Mark. In the Gospel of Mark. Now, why is this important? Mark 1, uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 8. Now, why is this important that we hear this out of the book of Mark? The reason why, because historically, the person who wrote the Gospel of Mark, Mark is actually the oldest of the three synoptic Gospels, okay, and really all the Gospels. Mark is actually the oldest, okay? It's actually the oldest, meaning it was the first. It was the first Gospel written. It was written by a man that we see in, that we see in the book of Acts by the name of John Mark, okay? John Mark was the one who wrote the Gospel of Mark. But the information that he received to write the Gospel of Mark, that's where it came from. 
most of it came from Peter. So Peter was the consultative consultant for John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. So much of what you see in the Gospel of Mark is renderings of what Peter testified about Jesus, had testified about in regards to John the Baptist, had testified about in regards to the ministry with Jesus Christ. That's why one re main reason why it's significant. Because that account in verse 8, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Hmm. See the connection? But not only that, not only that, we see it in the Gospels here. I told you why it's important and important from the perspective of Peter, okay? Historically, because John Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark, who basically Mark used Peter and Peter's accounts in order to write the, that gospel. Now let's go to the beginning of Acts. Acts chapter number one. And listen to this. Acts chapter one. Now remember, that verse that I read in Mark, remember, that was John the Baptist speaking, okay? Remember, that was John the Baptist who was speaking. I baptize you with water, but there's one greater than I that will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Let me read. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Now, this is Jesus speaking. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John, this is verse 5, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. There it is. There it is. This is Jesus speaking right before Pentecost. Right before Pentecost. Jesus speaks to them during that period of 40 days that he was still seen on earth after he was resurrected, he says the exact words that John the Baptist spoke at the Jordan River in Mark 1, verse 8. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You see, there is a connection and God's word is just not going to return back to him void. It will be consistent. His word will be consistent. And I had to show you all that because what Peter is explaining, he's making the connection to what the ministry began as and what the ministry actually is now. And guess what? The meaning and definition of what the ministry is has not changed. It hasn't changed. It is consistent. It is consistent. 
God is not a man that he should lie, nor, nor one that should change his mind. God is consistent. He's consistent. And with this, that also means that if God is consistent, Christ is consistent, that the word of God is not meant to separate people. It is there to unify individuals to God's character, his likeness, his love, his fellowship, that we will all understand that we are all children of God and that we are inclusive in the kingdom of God. And that there is no ex exclusivity in the kingdom of God. You don't have VIPs in the kingdom. Hmm. I hope this helps someone tonight and prayerfully to make that connection. Let me read further in Acts chapter 11. And then it says, verse 17, this is what Peter says. Now he's coming to some conclusions that he wants the Jews that he's talking to to come to these same conclusions. So he says, so if God gave them the same gift he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, Peter says, who was I to think I could stand in God's way? Woo, that's heavy. There's an humbling that Peter says, who, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? So why are you trying to stand in God's way and put up barriers to say that you're exclusive in regards to your relationship with God? Wow. So Peter understood, I need to move and get out the way and let God do what God does because it is tied to God's will. And who am I? Who am I to stand in God's way? That's humility for you right there. That, that is truly being able to suppress yourself and pull yourself down in order to see God's plan be executed and for us to sit back, be quiet, shut up, and learn a lesson or some lessons to what God wants to show us, instruct us on, to correct us in, and to make us better through. Hmm. Mm, wow. Verse number 18. When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. And that's what this thing is all about, y'all that we will repent of our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, forgive us of our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what this is about. And I, and I think what this does, the testimony helps to, at least for these Jews, to realign them back to God's God's intended purpose of his salvation. Not their theoretical hypothesis or definition of what they think it should be. And I think this is why it's important for us to really recenter ourselves back to the purposes of God, which allows us to see what God's will and purpose is. And again, this is why I had to go back to, to Mark 1 and 8 and then connect it to Acts 1 and 5 because it's not only the consistency, but 
God has a way of basically saying the same thing over and over again in various different ways. Sometimes he says it verbatim. Sometimes he connects it in a way where it is not, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily, the, the verbiage may not be the same, all the words might not be the same, but the concept and the idea is. And he doesn't sway away from it. He doesn't skew to the left or the right, or to the right. It's not lukewarm. He doesn't go left one, in one instance to go right the next. No, he stays right in line. He stays consistent. Consistent because that is the character of Christ. That is the character of God. And so with that, that's the lesson that again is learned from what we see in this lesson tonight. Again, I'm in a little early, about 10 minutes early. Um, again, thank you for your comments. Please share this with whomever you wish to share it with um, uh, over, the, over the airways of Facebook uh, so that they can be blessed by this lesson and others as well. Uh, just thank God for all of you. Do a, a quick roll call real quick. Um, I see that, uh, Sister McDuffie, good to see you. Um, I mean, God bless you, um, Deacon Scott, um, uh, Sister Mildred Scott, um, good to see y'all. Uh, Brother Marcus Berry, good to see you, sir. I pray that you're well. These are the comments that I can see. I can't see all of them because they're not all popping up. But again, I see you all out there. And again, I just thank God for those that are watching here live on tonight. Thank God for your very presence uh, on this Bible study on this evening. That's it. That's all I have for tonight. Um, uh, next week, we'll, we'll make the connection to chapter uh, 11, verse 19. And prayer for the next week, we'll probably finish out 11. 11 is a short chapter. And uh, we'll finish out 11 on next week um, in verses 19 through um, 30. 19 through 30. We'll go ahead and finish that out and uh, finish out chapter 11 on next week. Again, may God bless you. May heaven smile upon you uh, in everything that we do. I want to have a quick word of prayer uh, just for us as we dismiss. Uh, again, please share this. Please share this uh, with, with folks on your page and so forth so that the message of Jesus Christ goes out. It's not about Pastor Agwood. It is about truly Jesus and him crucified. Uh, this is why we do what we do and why we're called to what we're doing in ministry. Um, I just ask you to pray with me at this time as we're going to be uh, dismissed at this time from this study. Let us pray. Most eternal and all wise God, our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the study tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the connection of reconnecting the testimony of what occurred in chapter 10, and the testimony of Peter to the Jews. Because now is another audience, O oh Lord, that was hearing that same message, but also need to be realigned and aligned to your purpose, that they weren't exclusive to your salvation, that anyone can have your salvation, Lord, if they only come to the repentance of their sins and recognize you, recognize your son as Lord and Savior, who was crucified, buried, but rose again on the third day with all power in his hand and is alive today. And that's how your salvation, O oh Lord, is procured. That's how we get it. By acknowledging our faults, but acknowledging you as God and your Son as Savior. We thank you, Father, for all that you continue to do. Bless us, Lord, as we leave this uh, virtual space, but not from your presence. Give us what we need on this journey of life and allow us, Lord, to continue to see your glory in the days ahead. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am Pastor Hagwood. I am Reverend Eshawn Hagwood, um, excuse me, Senior Pastor of the First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. God's blessings to you. Y'all take care and be blessed. Be sure to share this, please. Please share this with your friends and whomever else so that they may see um, the, they see the um, the work of God and the salvation of God in their own lives. And maybe, just maybe, if they don't know Jesus Christ, that they may come into the aspect of salvation and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I yield. I surrender. What must I do to be saved? Uh, Y'all take care. Be blessed. I saw Deacon Melissa Adams just popped on. Uh, thank God for you. Take care. Be blessed. 
And if it's God's will, we'll see you next time. Take care and be blessed.